Hello, Real World Clinicians. This is Ali Nasse with another Real World presentation for you. I'm joined today by Dr. Shafiq Safi, Real World Endo faculty from Montreal, Canada. Dr. Safi, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Dr. Safi is an endodontist and educator. He's also the founder and director of Centre Endodontique in Saint Laurent, uh, Canada, near Montreal, and also an adjunct assistant professor and lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania and McGill Universities. Dr. Safi, you have a very interesting presentation for us today titled Ultrasonic Irrigation. Now, irrigation is obviously a critical component of uh, success and outcome of our cases. So why don't you please go ahead and uh, uh, present this topic to our viewers who I'm sure are very eager to hear your opinions on this particular topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as, I, as you said, Dr. Nasse, uh, irrigation is very important and whenever you open the GOE or any endodontic or any scientific, uh, dental scientific journal, we have a lot of one uh, irrigation ads for various gadgets and, and, and adjuncts. And you have a lot of articles that really try to talk about irrigation. But before we talk about irrigation, I want to just re uh, refresh our memory of why do we do this? Why do we irrigate? So endodontic therapy really consists of fighting the bacteria that invade the root canal system. And this has been shown again and again by various uh, classical study that bacteria are the source of, of endodontic disease, which is apical periodontitis. And getting rid of the bacteria or disinfecting the root canal system by using our files and by using irrigation really helps us to uh, exert or to uh, have a good microbial control and to promote the success of our therapy. But we have to also know that it's not as simple as introducing a file and introducing our uh, irrigant and there you go, the, the, the job is done. We have a lot of challenges. And the main challenge always is that we have non round canals. And more specifically, we have a lot of long oval canals and we have a lot of isthmuses or networks and fins and webs that we cannot reach with our files because uh, uh, like, like physically our file cannot go there and we cannot reach with our irrigant. So if you look our, at our traditional syringe uh, irrigation, <clears throat> a traditional 30 gauge syringe that we introduce into our canal and we uh, flush the sodium hypochlorite, which is the most commonly used irrigant, into that canal space. If you are lucky to have a straight canal that we have access to about one millimeter of the uh, of the uh, working land, what we see here on this computer, computational fluid dynamics uh, done by Butsukis in 2010 is that our irrigant might really maybe flow about 1 to 1.5 millimeter from the tip and the velocity as illustrated on the left hand side in this scale or the shear stress of the irrigant is really concentrated at the portal of exit of our, uh, of our uh, irrigation, irrigation, irrigation syringe. Now, sometimes, you know, we don't tend to be able to take our files all the way down. So at three or five millimeters, you can imagine that we have less and less irrigant being uh, uh, delivered up to the working gland. And of course, we have less, let's say, exchange of this irrigant with the, uh, with this, uh, with the root canal system. So our bacterial control or the antibacterial effect of our irrigant is not optimized in this case. So we have a lot of adjuncts or a lot of uh, uh, things that we could do to, uh, to, to complement our irrigation. In this uh, presentation, as you said, I'm going to talk about passive ultrasonic irrigation. And when we talk about passive ultrasonic irrigation, what it really means is that we are trying to agitate, or in other ways, in the common language, to shake the irrigant inside the root canal system using an instrument, which most of the time will be a small file, that will ultrasonicate, that will oscillate in an ultrasonicate fashion, meaning that it will go back and forth about 25 to 30 kilohertz or 25,000 to 30,000 back and forth times or cycles per second. And we have a lot of, or two types of passive ultrasonic irrigation. We have the intermittent passive ultrasonic irrigation, meaning the irrigant is delivered using our traditional syringe. And then we introduce our, uh, our uh, ultra ultrasonic uh, uh, file into that uh, root canal system or we have continuous passive ultrasonic irrigation whereby the irrigant is delivered and agitated at the same time through the same syringe. And it's important in this case to mention that these two uh, kinds are passive, 
meaning that they do not touch the walls or they do not cause any additional instrumentation of the root canal system. So our instrumentation has to be done and finished, and then we could uh, uh, proceed and do these as a final step of irrigation. And looking at this small video uh, of a file uh, oscillating in an ultrasonic fashion in the water that has had some dye, we can really appreciate the shear stress, the velocity, and what they call the currents or the eddies, as they call them in fluid uh, dynamics, of the file that's really creating all this like uh, uh, shaking up of things inside. We can imagine that being done in a canal and how far maybe we can send the irrigant into those webs and fins and fins into and into these irregular areas, as uh, as it's uh, uh, illustrated by this study by Kishin in 2014. The ultrasonic file, uh, as we see, has a lot of like red and yellow, which means that it has a lot of velocity and creates a lot of shear stress around it. When we compare it to a one millimeter traditional syringe up to, uh, let's say, introduced to one millimeter of the canal, we see that there's much more action happening around the ultrasonic irrigation file, which we would hope that it will help us to uh, reach a better microbial control and to uh, be, uh, be able to debride more effectively our canal. And so, Looking at really the studies that uh, investigate this issue of uh, bacteria after and before uh, ultrasonic irrigation, a study by Carver in 2007 took a bunch of uh, lower molars, hand and rotary uh, instrumented them, and divided them into two groups. One group that didn't receive no ultrasonic irrigation, and another one that received one minute of ultrasonic irrigation. And after that, they uh, did the bacterial culturing, and what they found is that they were seven times more likely to get a negative culture using one minute of ultrasonic irrigation. And we know that less bacteria means less problems, meaning we have, have we, 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 we created a better microbial control. And so this is one uh, proof that passive ultrasonic irrigation can help us reach our, uh, our, our goal in disinfecting the root canal system. When we look at the isthmuses and the irregularities that we want to tend to clean, this study by Burleson uh, investigated the isthmus cleaning properties of passive ultrasonic irrigation. As we see in this middle picture of the slide, this is a CT picture, and, and the arrow really shows the isthmus that's present between uh, two canals. On the right-hand side, we have a histopathological picture, and we really see the isthmus and all the debris that, that is really packed into this isthmus. And so the protocol of Burleson consisted, uh, uh, it was very similar to the protocol of Carver, meaning they had two groups of teeth, a group that was uh, just instrumented without any uh, uh, ultrasonic irrigation, and another group that was instrumented with one minute of ultrasonic irrigation. And what they found is that on the left-hand side, when they did not do any ultrasonic irrigation, the isthmus was still packed with debris, even the canal still contained debris. And when they obturated these canals, we can see that the isthmus is still packed with debris uh, uh, clinically. On the teeth where, or on the canals where one minute of ultrasonic irrigation was applied, the isthmus was cleaner, and even the canals was cleaner. The canals were cleaner, and the isthmus was being able to be uh, filled with uh, gutta percha and sealer in this case. So we see that it, uh, passive ultrasonic irrigation helps us have better microbial control and helps us have uh, more uh, cleanliness of isthmuses. And just a small study that shows us that if we use passive ultrasonic irrigation, it also helps us get rid of the smear layer. In this study where uh, they took single canal teeth, instrumented them to a size of 40 or 4, and divided them into various irrigation protocols, the first one, with sodium hypochlorite, the second one with EDTA, which is a chelating agent or a decalcifying agent, which removes the, smear, uh, the uh, inorganic part of the smear layer. And I combined this with sodium hypochlorite. And the third group, they added passive ultrasonic irrigation to the EDTA followed by sodium hypochlorite. And we see that in the third group, 100% of all the cases scored a score of zero, meaning that there was no smear layer at all that was detected. And when we look at EDTA and sort of hypochlorite without passive ultrasonic irrigation, we see that about 50% only of these teeth had a smear layer free canals and the rest had smear layer. And just a small parenthesis, we know that today studies suggest that we have to remove smear layer because you know, it could harbor a lot of bacteria, it could be used as a substrate by bacteria, and could also hinder the effect of our intracanal medicament in the cases where we use, let's say, calcium hydroxide. 
So in conclusion of this uh, small presentation, uh, what I want uh, to say is that the root canal anatomy presents a challenge to achieve microbial control. This is always a big challenge. The traditional syringe is not effective at all. We have to have some other kind of adjunct or some other kind of addition to our irrigation protocol. There are a lot of them out there, but in this presentation, we only took into account uh, passive ultrasonic irrigation. And the one minute addition of passive ultrasonic irrigation well, with sodium hypochlorite and the EDTA helps us not only uh, optimize microbial control, but get a cleaner and uh, a cleaner canal and cleaner uh, isthmus. Well, that's terrific, uh, Dr. Safi. I am a huge fan of ultrasonics. When people say what unique instrument has really changed your practice over the past, uh, you know, 20 years, I usually tell them, well, you know, we all want to talk about microscopes and nitire files and things like that. But the one thing that I use on a daily basis on every patient is my ultrasonic. And I really can't do without it. To be honest, if it comes to deciding on a given case, if I were to use my ultrasonic, or if I were to give up my ultrasonic or my apex locator, which one would I give up? I would definitely give up my apex locator. I think <laughs> ultrasonic is a key component of uh, our procedures from the access all the way to the irrigation as you so, as you so very nicely demonstrated here. In cases of um, using the ultrasonic as the final type of an, um, um, way of agitating the um, the solution that you may leave in the canals. You mentioned the combination of a chelating agent followed by a uh, disinfectant such, such as hi sodium hypochlorite. What I, do you think we can do to help reduce potential extrusion of the disinfectant due to the ultrasonic forces? That's a good question, Dr. Nassi, and uh, I should have maybe added it in this presentation. There were a lot of studies out there, in vitro studies, uh, unfortunately, we know that they have a lot of limitations. But they really tell us that the, uh, the, the displacement of fluid with the uh, uh, passive ultrasonic irrigation is always in the like, lateral direction. And there's really not a lot of displacement in the apical direction. But anyhow, there's a lot of stuff that we can do to prevent these kind of accidents. So what, we, what, what I used to do is always, even when I irrigate with a traditional syringe, I always have a stopper. I always pre-bend my, uh, my syringe. To a level after, let's say, I, I, I found my working gland, I bend it usually about two millimeter uh, more coronal to the, ape, uh, ape, uh, to the uh, working gland to make sure that I don't extrude any uh, irrigant. And I also measure, uh, I have a stopper on my passive ultrasonic irrigating file that's also about one millimeter uh, uh, shorter than the working gland. And I try to keep as steady as possible as what I'm doing this, and I rarely get any. Um, any extrusion. So we really have to be careful and keep our measure and our stoppers at a consistent uh, uh, pattern to make sure that we're not extruding any of these uh, irrigants. Even though the, the procedure itself is not inherent a lot to, to cause this. Yeah, of course. I agree. All of those irrigation protocols to help reduce and minimize extrusion are important. What about the concentration of sodium hypochlorite? Does it, uh, do you prefer full strength co concentration or you prefer something that's less potentially uh, toxic if extruded, such as a 2% solution or something like that? I, I tend to like high concentration sodium hypochlorite. I use uh, 3% in my office because I like the dissolving agent of, of high concentration. When I take uh, less uh, concentrated sodium hypochlorite, and as we know, it, it tends to dissolve the tissue less effectively. And, you know, I, I, I don't stop myself at saying that it, if, it's, if it extrudes, it's, uh, it's less concentrated, it's less damaged. I try to really control my extrusion and my hands and my working length all the time and really make sure that I'm using a decent concentration to, to disinfect and to, uh, to dissolve all the uh, tissue that's in the isthmuses and in the canal. Yeah. Of course, during the, uh, the irrigation protocol, you're, you're absolutely right, I use full strength myself. Of course, I do use negative pressure. But I'm yeah. just talking about the specific point at the very end with the one-minute irrigation uh, or ultrasonication or activation protocol. Do you still, would, would you still be comfortable yeah. with the full strength then in those situations? Yeah, 100%. Perfect. 100%. 100% hypochlorite. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, 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 so, uh, <laughs> no, I know, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 
<laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, that'll dissolve the two. Oh my God. Uh, so, um, what, what, what I was going to say is we all know that the mechanism of the um, ultrasonics is through these three specific phenomena that comes with ultrasonication, which is your cavitation, your acoustic streaming, sure. and the agitation of the fluids. It also has the additional effect that has been shown by literature of physically disturbing the biofilm sure. through these, you know, these um, uh, shock waves, if you will, and so on. So that's another additional benefit. That's part of the reason why you know it's been shown by the Cunningham and all those older studies that yeah. show that it reduce, removes the smear layer so effectively. So this is why I think it's also important to make sure that people are using the ultrasonics uh, uh, with fluid at all time and not dry because the, the fluid is the way that the energy is dispersed. Now, I use ultrasonics routinely throughout the procedure okay. with just water during the first phase of the procedure just to remove the debris. Um, do you do that as well? or um, And then obviously I irrigate with hypochlorite, but I just use that as a quick way of removing debris. Do you, do you ever do that? Yeah, I tend sometimes, especially uh, to clean, let's say at the end, to clean my uh, sealer, I use BC sealer to clean it from the access cavity. I use like a uh, like an E14D um, with water. Mm -hmm. It tends to really clean everything. And during access, sometimes to redefine the canals and to reshape the walls of the access cavity, I use my uh, ultrasonics with, with water, definitely, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I use it all the way from the, even during the instrumentation at times to just remove the loose debris with water, ah, and then okay. I add hypochlorite to turn the water into um, to, to bleach. But anyway, so this is uh, this was really super uh, informative. Thank you so much. Uh, I was joined today by Dr. Thank Shafiq you. Safi, assistant professor and lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania and McGill University postdoc in the Donic programs, and also the founder of director of Centre Endodontique in uh, Saint Laurent. Uh, Dr. Safi, thank you so much again for this wonderful and educational uh, presentation. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, we will then do. I'm Ali Nasser, and I hope you found this information helpful.